Good morning, members. We're now live on YouTube, so we'll start this meeting. Uh, welcome to Children and Young People Overview and Management Scrutiny Committee. For the uh, benefit of YouTube viewers, uh, members of the committee are here in the chamber today. Uh, we have Councillor John Copsey, who, who's usually the chairman on Zoom. Uh, we also have uh, officers and uh, members of staff with us in the room. We have Corptees and portfolio holder uh, Councillor Aitken. Um, can, can members please ensure that all mobile phones are switched off or on silent? Uh, if the fire alarm sounds, please exit the room via the fire doors, which will be signposted by our Senate committee manager. Um, and before we get started, the, um, as this is Sarah Sheen's last meeting, um, on behalf of the, the whole subcommittee, I'd like to thank her for, for joining us for the last year and for the work she's put in. Uh, she's been a great addition to the committee and uh, I think she'll be missed by all of us. Um, so we'll move on to the agenda. Um, the first agenda item is, do we have any declarations of interest, please? Councillor Smith. Uh, I sit on the foster panel. Any other interests? I have one in that I am a governor at Goal Academy. Okay, that's uh, declarations of interest, thank you. Uh, and the next agenda item, number two, uh, minutes to approve as a true record the minutes of the meeting held on the 15th of June 2022. Is everyone happy with us? Yeah, seeing nods. That's fine. And that takes us on to agenda my, uh, item three, Ofsted inspection into children's care services. For this item, we have Owen Rush, who's the director, uh, Paul Elliott, Holly Troughton, and three social workers, Tara, Janet and Sarah. Thank you for coming. It's nice to have you here. Um, and I'll hand over to Owen, Owen first, who's going to give us a, a 15 minute presentation along with his colleagues. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be 15 minutes, but I'm really pleased to introduce this item this morning. And I will leave colleagues from Children's Social Care to take uh, the committee through the paper. I do want to just make a few points to set the scene. Um, firstly, really pleased to be presenting this paper this morning. I think it represents some incredible hard work, determination uh, and tenacity by the children's social care workforce over a prolonged period of time and during an incredibly difficult period uh, in everyone's history. Um, this is the second report that we've brought in relation to progress uh, and it reflects on what are a series of mini inspections that are undertaken by Ofsted uh, to look at and review progress that's being made across children's services and in particular children's social care since 2019 when there was that very challenging inspection. Uh, I, the committee will have had the chance to read the paper and uh, the two most recent reports uh, and they reflect on what I think Ofsted describes as steady and consistent progress. Uh, and more recently, and pleasingly, progress that has become even more pacier in terms of where we want to get to. Two, two other quick comments from me. Uh, right from the outset of this process, uh, now almost two and a half years ago, I think as a council, we were determined not to look for a quick fix to the problems that were identified in 2019 but to do a fundamental review and rebuild of the services and the systems that are in place to support and protect our vulnerable children. Uh, I think the service has been absolutely true to those aims uh, and uh, Ofsted have confirmed time and time again that the building blocks are now really firmly in place. And what they're also beginning to see, which I think is probably more important than anything else, is impact in terms of improved outcomes for children. Children are safer, the responses to concerns are far more effective. Uh, and perhaps from my perspective, a, a personal view, the use of feedback from families to test that and see if it's actually true is being pulled through by the service on, on a regular basis. So um, I, I think huge credit to the service. Um, there's no complacency at all. Uh, progress against these type of improvement plans is never linear. Uh, there are always challenges that come along and affect the pace and the progress. Um, that will always be the case, whatever the badge Ofsted gives a local authority. But it's clear there are some significant challenges that we will continue to be reporting, I think, to this committee and elsewhere in the coming years. And they are similar to every local authority, which relate to the huge recruitment problems that currently exist. And of course, delivering this type of programme of progress 
with a workforce that is depleted because of those recruitment pro, uh, problems is a challenge. The team are working on that, and we've got some uh, contingency and future plans to address that. But I think for me, it makes all the more impressive the work that this group are doing at the moment to get the services for children, both safeguarding and support, exactly where we'd want them to be. Chair, I'll pause there, and I think I'm handing over to uh, Holly Troughton in the first instance. Holly's our principal social worker and with other colleagues uh, who are joining me this morning has played a key role in getting us to where we are so far. Thank you, Owen. Holly. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, I intend just to go through the key headlines from the report, which summarises the key areas for improvement and the development work undertaken over the last six months. Um, the improvement activity covers the time since the item was last before the subcommittee. You will, uh, members will be aware that a, an improvement notice was issued to East Ryden of Yorkshire Council in July 2020, following our Ofsted inspection in December 2019. Since then, there's been four um, monitoring visits undertaken by Ofsted. Since this item was last before the committee, there's been a further two um, monitoring visits undertaken, one being in, on the 7th and 8th of February 2022, and the second being on the 4th and 5th of May 2022. Members will note that the outcome of those inspections was very positive. Um, in February, the inspectors found that the, with the services continued to improve um, since the local authority was judged to be inadequate, and sustainable progress has been made in all areas reviewed at the visit. Um, in the latter inspection in May, the inspectors noted that there had been a notable improved progress made in the quality of social work practice and um, a determined and stable leadership no team knows its service extremely well. It's anticipated that we will um, be receiving a further monitoring visit from Ofsted in September, although the scope of that visit has not yet been confirmed. And there's also a, a strong possibility of a further ILAX full inspection um, at the, in the latter part of the year though we've, we, there has been indications that that won't be before October. In relation to key update um, areas, our safeguarding partnership hub has remained fully operational throughout the whole of COVID and they've now returned to a five-day physical um, presence in the office um, where there's been an improved focus on improved multi-agency working. Um, this includes um, improved co-location of key partner agencies, including um, as a result of council investment in the safeguarding and education team. Um, which means that an education safeguarding officer is in a safeguarding hub every day. There's also been work um, developed alongside our colleagues in the Humberside Police, um, where they've been piloting the vulnerability hub, um, which includes a daily pit stop meeting, so that we can really make sure that children who need to be referred through to our services are identified early, and those that don't need to be referred through to our services get the right support at the right level. Over 80% of feedback received from partners in respect to the safeguarding hub is is positive and there's now weekly partnership engagement meetings um, to make sure that there's real time space for reflective discussions. Um, members will note that we have seen an increase in 63% more contacts during um, the period October to November, uh, October to March compared to on the previous year. However, despite um, the increased demand that staff are seeing um, within the front door, the quality of contact records has improved. Page. In relation to, um, sorry, I've got mixed up. Bear with me a second. In the, with SAF, um, we continue to have weekly, monthly, and quarterly performance information, which enables managers to monitor trends and review data with the team to consider the impact of children. We've seen that work really well in relation to some early identification of issues that have been resolved very quickly. And there continues to be robust action plans to maintain and further develop practice within our front door. In relation to the reshaping the social work offer, um, our members will be aware of the what we were terming the North Assessment Pilot, where statutory social work assessment activity was separated for the longer term social work activity um, in the North cluster of the East Riding. That pilot ran for six months and there was a robust evaluation which supported um, us to identify strengths and areas for development. We've now um, moved into a full reshape of the social work offer where the, um, as of the 4th of July, so very recently, our teams have been separated into an assessment service and a supporting and strengthening families service with the aim of um, the separation of these functions um, with the aim of driving further improvements to the overall quality of social work intervention and support for families as it allows the social workers to be more focused and ensures that children are getting the right support at the right time. 
In relation to our model of practice being a whole host of um, activity around the model of practice. So members will be aware previously that our model was solely focused around science of safety approach and the science of safety framework. We've moved into a much more wider framework that still includes science of safety, but focuses much more widely on other elements of practice as well. Really focusing on that relationship based model of practice that we know is the most effective when working with children and families. Um, two model of practice leads posts have been created who were responsible for supporting the implementation and embedding of the Stronger Together approach across the service. And alongside those colleagues, we have 44 Stronger Together ambassadors and 58 practice leads. We have um, been very successful in our implementation. Phase one to three is now complete. We've moved into phase four, which focuses on um, signs of safety reset. And our phase five will start in November, which focuses on our partnership offer. Running consecutively to these implementation phases, there's been a bespoke leadership program, um, which has been available for all managers across the service area. Um, early review of the model implementation has been positive. Ofsted has noted from the monitoring visit that the model of practice is becoming more consistently evident in the work with families and is positively influencing assessment and planning seen at the visit. Um, the, what we will um, we continue to be aware of that we are early days um, into a two year implementation plan. So there is further work to do in relation to the model being embedded. Performance data and management oversight was a key area of concern um, from the original ILAX inspection. Um, the high level performance data members will be aware was a significant area of um, improvement activity that continues to offer senior leaders the ability to scrutinize and monitor data and highlight um, any themes and trends early. What um, we do now have is we have um, social work team managers uh, at all levels have access to performance data on a weekly basis. So they now have a um, team dashboard which allows them to look at exceptions and to plan and monitor the performance and maintain oversight of social work practice within their teams. Um, the report does mention ASIAS care. I will defer to my colleagues here um, because there, there is an item before um, the committee today in relation to ASIAS and, and I'm sure performance data forms part of that report. In relation to our quality practice framework, this is the mechanism in which we keep a line of sight um, over and above what the performance data tells us. So it tells us about the quality and what our practice actually looks like. Um, members will be aware the quality of practice framework was revised and launched in June 2021. There has been a further um, yearly evaluation as part of the implementation plan and further revisions have been launched in July of this year. Um, the revised frameworks incorporates the model of practice to ensure we effectively measure the implementation and use the model in support with intervention with families. And we've moved away from um, the graded um, judgment in, in line with Ofsted so that we um, focus on the continuing improvement as a system as opposed to being associated solely with Ofsted grading. Recruitment and retention has continued over the last six months to be a significant concern and members will be aware of the long-standing issue that we face in relation to um, the recruitment of social workers in particular in the East Rising. High levels of vacancies have continued to impact workload of social workers and contributed to further workforce instability. However, we have continued to remain co um, focused on our in and investing on our Grow Your Own strategy, um, which we are confident is the right approach to be taken to recruitment of social workers. We are um, very delighted to be welcoming 21 newly qualified social workers. I have Sarah Parsons sat alongside me, who is one of those newly qualified social workers that joined our team as recently as last week. Um, and that has really helped fill some of those vacancies within our social work teams. Of course, whilst our recruitment has been really successful, we, um, don't acknowledge, uh, we, sorry, we do acknowledge that that brings with it some um, difficulties in relation to inexperience within the social work teams. But we are, we've got plans in, in order to maintain um, the teams and to support them as we, as we move through the next year. Alongside the recruitment activity, we've relentlessly focused on retention of our existing staff. A salary supplement's been added to all social work grades in lieu of the corporate total pay and reward review, where it's really hoped that social work pay in East Ryden will reflect and be competitive within the regional market. Obviously, um, and reassuringly, our recruitment and retention continues to be a main priority as we move into and embed the new social work structure. Our learning and development offer has been significantly improved over the last six months. The learning and development offer for the workforce is centrally coordinated and it's been driven through the participation, innovation and improvement portfolio. 
because our learning and development offer has grown so significantly over the last six months, we've now separated out the functions from um, coaching and mentoring, which will have one manager overseeing that activity. And our academy um, model will have another team manager overseeing the academy and core learning and development offer. Um, the learning development offer continues to be responsive to needs identified through the quality of practice framework with coaching and mentoring opportunities available to the workforce at all levels. Um, and as I've just alluded to in relation to the newly qualified social work cohort, there is going to be a temporary increase in the effective practice mentors to ensure that we support um, our, our teams whilst we have a high level of inexperience. Feedback from workforce and families, we continue to strengthen all the time. We recognise that there is still work to do in terms of um, the central analysis of our children and families um, feedback. And in light of that, we have realigned some of our existing um, resource to centrally locate some of our project officers that can focus and drive that um, continued activity around child and family feedback and ensuring that that um, contributes to the learning development of our, of our system as a whole. Um, We have improved our um, touch points with our teams as well. Um, with, so social workers now have improved opportunities and practitioners right across the service area have improved opportunities to be able to speak with senior leaders, hear about improvements and contribute to those um, improvements, which you will note from the report, um, the social workers have been very positive about that when speaking with inspectors. In relation to successes and challenges, just in summary, our, um, you will see that we've had a comprehensive program of improvement and it's resulting in good progress, which people are, are, are noticing, it's been not recognised by Ofsted and there's a positive trajectory in the quality of our practice. And that is a result of a collective effort across the whole workforce. We have a committed leadership team who know the service and quality of practice extremely well and re remain focused on continued improvement. However, we know that there's always gonna be significant challenges um, faced by our practice system. We've, we've alluded already to the inexperience within our social work teams, but the national context of children's social services is also changing. There's been an independent review of children's social care, which makes significant recommendations to how children's services are delivered. And this is likely to shape the national agenda across the next five years. Um, Sufficiency of suitable homes for children who are looked after continues to be a national concern, but certainly here within the East Riding as well. Um, though we are responding creatively to these challenges through the development and reshaping of our children's home offer. And lastly, I would just like to say that whilst we are very, very encouraged by our positive progress, we are not um, being complacent. We know that this further activity take place. We've got a line of sight on the activity that still needs to be made place, and we are continuing those improvements with energy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Um, if members would like to signal to, to my vice chair if they have questions, I will just quickly say that, that that report was really comprehensive. I think members will agree that it's good to, to hear the challenges recognised. Um, obviously, we set policy and, and if we don't know the challenges, it's hard for us to, to give you the tools to equip you to, to address those challenges. But it's also great to hear about the, the continued progress uh, in the service. And I think that's a testament to, to the hard work of, of members of staff throughout the service, as you said, on all levels. So um, first of all, uh, as for questions, can I have uh, Councillor Smith, please? Thank you. Um, I have two questions, if that's OK. That's fine. Um, right. Um, the North Assessment pilot, um, how is that going? And will it be expanded to other areas? And can you just explain what it's all about? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the report alludes to some of this, but I appreciate that it's quite in brief, so I'll try and expand a little bit further. So the North Apart Assessment Pilot was in place for six months, and there was a um, review of the North Assessment Pilot where we identified some real strengths in the service delivery and the, um, the work that social workers were able to do with families and the experience of families within that system. What that evaluation also did was highlight some um, areas of development that we could really utilise to help strengthen when we moved into this offer right across our service. So we, as of the 4th of July, so very recently last week, we have moved into where the full service delivery of our statutory social work offer is now in an assessment service and strengthening and support in families team, which is the new name for our our uh, social work service that offers support and intervention to children and families. Um, so it's very early days in relation to that. Evaluation will form part of that ongoing implementation of the assessment 
teams and service and the strengthening and supporting family service but we have now moved into that model across the full social work service for the children in need of help and protection thank you thank you and my next question um has has have the use of agency workers reduced and have we got our own you'll note from the report that we've continued to have a very high um vacancy rate so over that time we have had to um, supplement our system with agency workers and it's right that we do that so as not to put too much pressure onto our social work teams particularly in light of our of us wanting to retain our existing workforce there has been a temporary increase as we've moved into the um, reshape of our social work offer and that's one thing that we learned from the assessment pilot was that we needed that temporary increase in staff to support the shift in services so that we could make sure that children continued to get the right support as we realigned our systems and approaches across the service and um, we didn't want our children and families to be impacted by our own internal procedures so we have got a temporary increase in agency workers which um, is twofold it supports the um, reshape and it supports our system with additional experience while we've got um, our newly qualified social workers coming into our system because our newly qualified social workers will only become registered with Social Work England and therefore be able to practice as social workers um, from now up until September. So that some of them are not able to undertake their statutory functions yet. So it's important that we do have people there and available that are registered experienced social workers to do that work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, just, just for note, the, the wiggle system is in place. So if, if you have any questions on that, it's handy to keep the conversation going on on that particular topic. Um, next, we have Councillor Dewhurst, please. Thank you very much, Sharon, and thank you for the presentation and all the work you do. Um, very much appreciate uh, the hard, hard efforts you've put in particular the last two years. I just wanted to talk about retention and pay in particular. The salary supplement that you mentioned of is very welcome, and, and hopefully that brings us up to, to compete with neighbouring local authorities. Do you have a plan in pace over the next year or so with inflationary pressures? Uh, should we suddenly find ourselves in a less competitive position again on pay if local authorities react with uh, pay increases and how you might be able to deal with that. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, there's three parts to that answer, I think. The first is that we are almost on a daily basis watching what the competition looks like at the moment. Um, there's also, I think, uh, we've learned over the last year that there are a variety of kind of elements to retaining staff. Um, and it's probably not overstating it to say that social workers want to come and work in an environment where there are really safe arrangements and systems in place where there is good, clear, strong leadership like that from colleagues uh, and where there are opportunities to progress in their careers. S saying that money matters and particularly, you know, in the current climate. So the supplements that Holly has described are, are a bit of an emollient to kind of making sure that we're not lagging behind, uh, you know, those other local authorities where there are competing demands. Um, I think we're also obviously now into the total pay and reward system. Um, and actually that we believe is the right mechanism to make sure that, uh, you know, over the coming uh, years, we are both competitive and accurately kind of reflecting with our remuneration, the challenges, and some of them are quite unique and quite pressured of the jobs that social workers do. So I, I think uh, looking to the next um, two years, uh, the kind of overall plan is to continue to develop the workforce offer in its broadest sense, because that really does matter. And I think, you know, I let colleagues speak for themselves in terms of making East Riding attractive, where there's, you know, a risk that we're falling so far behind that our business continuity becomes a problem. We would have to look at some further interim arrangements to bridge or support that. But actually, that's not our strategy. Our strategy is the quality of the workforce offer and our total pay and reward offer as that lands, because that we hope will bring a kind of long lasting legacy of a, a kind of commensurate remuneration with the tasks that social workers are doing. Thank you very much. Um, if you don't mind, officers, uh, Councillor Weeks has a wiggle on that topic. I do. Yeah. And it, it it's around this idea of agency workforces that we've discussed in the past. Um, there is a recognition that really we can't ever compete with uh, with the cost that's being paid for agency workers and whilst there is an an ability to use that function we're almost cutting our nose off to spite our face because it's that vicious circle um have we you meant you've mentioned in the past this idea of a memorandum of, of understanding between 
um, certainly the more northern based uh, local authorities. Has there been any plans in the past, in the, the, the not too distant past, to look at expanding that nationwide? Um, has there been any conversations with national government around, um, around an introduction in a limit to the use of agency workforces? Owen. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Weeks. Uh, just uh, the, the regional Yorkshire and Humber memorandum was re-signed uh, only weeks ago. And that is introducing a, an agreement across the 15 local authorities that make up the Yorkshire and Humber uh, region around capping what the agency kind of rates will and should look like. And that helps. But you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we then as a kind of region border other regions uh, and what we don't want to do is to see, you know, a migration of those agency staff to, to other places for higher remuneration. So region by region, I'm aware that there are similar memoranda being signed as we speak. Um, I think it's really important because I would also want to say that agency staff play a really important and critical role in the services that we deliver. I think our use of them locally is absolutely what they were intended for, and that is to make sure that they can, if you like, complement our core workforce where we're bringing about changes or where there are temporary um, gaps in, in cover. Uh, they are not our, if you like, um, final solution in terms of our staffing issues, but they will continue to kind of feature as part of that. There are discussions uh, through the ADCS nationally about the use of agency staff and those spiraling costs. But the reality is at some point, those uh, really high costs will and are already starting to become unsustainable for most local authorities. And that in itself will start to curtail some of that continued growth upwards. Could I, yeah. Can, yeah. can I just ask as part of our regional memorandum of understanding, what, what is the cap that we've agreed to in terms of usage? Uh, I, I can get back to you on that. Um, there is a discussion at the moment about where it lands. I think in terms of the region, we're, we're down to kind of pounds and pence now, nothing greater than that in terms of um, where we set that. It's really important that that's set realistically. Um, and I think there is some debate about given the current pressures and climate where that needs to land. But I'm absolutely confident having not long come from the regional meeting that all 15 local authorities will absolutely adhere to that. And that will give us our first layer of protection. Thank you. Uh, um, may I recommend then that perhaps a recommendation, uh, I don't know what members would, would prefer to do, perhaps uh, either a briefing uh, or Councillor Aitken to update us on that in, in a future full council. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Councillor Hammond, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, officers, for your report. On page 17 of the report, paragraph 4.2 at the bottom, it says one of the um, challenges we're facing is not just increased demand, but also increased expectation. Could we just clarify what you mean exactly by that expectation and, and whose expectation is, is, is causing us pressures? Who'd like to take that one? I'll take it because I wrote the report. Um, it was <laughs> uh, the demand and expectation that relates to um, the complexity of the children and families and the support that they require. So it was just basically a broad um, catch all um, terminology to, you know, to capture the fact that our systems, you'll have note from, noted from the report that our staff has had a, I saw front door services had an increase of 63% um, referral rates. We've also had seen a similar increase in relation to our early help front door as well. Um, so it's really in, just in relation to the increased volume coming through and children and families that require support, which is going to continue in light of the um, challenges in relation to poverty and the, and the cost of living, but also in relation to the, the increased complexity, which has really come as a result of COVID um, in relation to children's mental health, well-being, et cetera. So it's, it's about the increase in demand and expectation around the, the services required for our children and families. Thank you very much. Do you have a supplementary? Well, that, that sort of explains the increased demand side. But I mean, I, I read that, and I might be wrong. Um, if, if, forgive me if I am. I read that expectation is that perhaps users of the service are expecting more than what the council should be providing as a statutory authority. Thank you. If I just just um, by way of some context, um, Holly mentioned in the report, um, the uh, case for change, which is the so national social care policy review document. Uh, and it, in a sense, uh, 
the subtext of part of that goes directly to the heart of your question, which is there's been a very clear, I think, recognition that social work, professionally qualified social workers is a finite resource. They, they, their task and their role and their kind of legal mandate is focused on a relatively small number of children and young people. And those typically who are with the most complex needs are most at risk. Um, given, if you like, the kind of current experience for many families at the moment, social work historically has been the go-to service for some respite or for some support. Uh, and I think the uh, comment in the report signals that it's really important that particularly the front door and our professionally, professionally qualified social workers are able to remain focused on those relatively few children who without their service will be in serious problem. I, I say that not about the, suggesting there isn't help for other families, uh, there is, but it's actually a very difficult job, I think, for the front door and for social workers to hold that line when families who are in genuine need sometimes turn to this particular service for help. Um, and the National uh, Case for Change is describing a even more focused, more targeted use of professionally qualified social workers to make sure that those children who are at risk of seriously poor outcomes are the ones that are in their sites all the time. We're constantly trying to grow our early help arrangements. Uh, we're looking at, as the committee will know from our financial planning arrangements, at the development of a family hub model, which is designed to create a much more holistic, responsive, multi-agency service for families, which is accessible, but perhaps not for those families who need this particular service. So it, it's, it's an important, really important question, because I think it also takes us back to the heart of the issue in 2019, where we were asking and expecting our social workers to deal with a breadth of issues that was way beyond what they would cope with. And we don't want to get back to a point of that system being overwhelmed, but we're not going to take our eye in a wider context off those other families who are going to need help and support in different ways. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Behram, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to know is, do you have uh, specific people that social workers can actually go to when they feel their mental health is in danger. We have done lots of work over the last year around our wellbeing strategy for our staff because we recognise children and families do not get a great service unless we've got really great staff who feel supported and their wellbeing is protected. We um, have, uh, in, corporately, we have a very strong offer in relation to wellbeing across the, um, across the council. So we have our Live Well Work Well team. What we have done is really strengthen the links between our Live Well Work Well team. So we now go out on joint visits with our Live Well Work Well team. We have our wellbeing wagon, which is essentially a mobile wellbeing offer that takes the wellbeing um, offer to our team so that we're not expecting social workers to travel from Goole into Beverley where the wellbeing offer is, is usually um, provided. Um, same with you know, our other outlying offices. So that has worked well and that's gone down very well with our team because one, it's there, they can see it, they're accessing it when maybe they wouldn't have accessed it previously, but we can signpost very effectively um, from our being, being able to do that outreach work. We have a new employee assistance scheme, which again is available for all colleagues across um, the local authority, but um, that offers a 24 seven, 365 day helpline to our staff, which is free of charge. That's, that is by qualified counsellors. And because we've just recontracted that service, that offers a much wider service than what previously um, we were able to offer. So that works with anything around anxiety, depression, um, stress, but it also um, supports with family issues, finances. And alongside that, there's also an online resource now. So there is now a um, whole um, Live Well, Work Well website, which signposts to all of these things. So there's lots of different ways that our staff are aware of and are able to access or be signposted where required. I'm just going to hand over to Sarah because I think one of my colleagues um, would like to come in on that. So point. Sarah and then Owen would like to come in. As well. Thank you. So I've recently joined the authority as a newly qualified social worker and one of my personal values is about staff well-being and, and it's really important to me that I want I wanted to work for an authority that I thought would support that and during the, the recruitment process I certainly feel that 
from my point of view, I feel supported by the authority. And I think other, other students and, and other newly qualified social workers would agree that it's, it's part of the rec recruitment process and, and we know where we can find that support. Thank you. Chair, I'm always reluctant to put uh, colleagues on the spot, but um, one of the kind of go-to people, I think, for social workers, particularly given what they deal with and how they work on a day-to-day -day basis is often their team managers. Um, so I um, just wonder whether Tara wanted to just kind of describe how that works because she's the one of our go-to people for social workers. Yes, yeah, certainly from my perspective as a team manager, it's it's about that relational work that we do with with not only with our families but with our with our colleagues. Um, as a team manager, I certainly think that I can understand my team. I recognise when they aren't feeling so great, and that's where it would always start within personal supervision. We have those conversations, and we provide that open space for social workers to share that with us. Because as Holly points out, we recognise that when a social worker isn't at their best, they aren't going to be delivering the best service to the children and families that we work with. So certainly from a team manager perspective, it's about knowing our um, knowing our social workers, understanding who they are as people and recognising those signs within them, directing them to all of the wellbeing support that's in place, utilising all of the support that Holly's, Holly's just explained. And also there may be times where we, where we do ask them, you know, um, to seek further support from their GP if that's work where they are feeling. So what we would always want to do is prevent a social worker from going off work sick and making sure that we're providing that support in the first instance. Thank you. That's such a great question, uh, Councillor Behram. Such a great topic of conversation. I have a wiggle from uh, Councillor Sutton. Yes. Hello there. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my question is, is related to the health related one. In view of all this current hot weather, I uh, just wondered how we're supporting our staff with, um, you know, having to managing to look after themselves and keep themselves hydrated in this up and coming, very, very hot weather. Thank you. I think we've um, enabled our team managers. Our team managers are very experienced um, colleagues. We haven't done anything specific in relation to the heat. And um, we do have our Wellbeing Wednesday, so we could perhaps build that into our Wellbeing Wednesday next week. But our team managers and our, our staff group are very experienced and team managers, I'm, I'm confident, can manage those arrangements within their team locations. Thank you. Thank you for that one. Uh, Andrew Smith on Zoom, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in reference to paragraph 3.2, which is around the feedback, really encouraging to see the families, um, the level of improvement in service, which is fantastic. If look at the letter in the sentence that talks about less responsive practitioners is that due to inexperience uh, with regards to obviously the level of new social workers or is it those with perhaps more embedded practice that needs to be changed and and if so what's being done practically to support to make um, practitioners more responsive thank you Sorry, Andrew, you, you was really quiet. We're, we're hearing you through a laptop. Did you hear that question? All right. I did hear yeah, that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Over you. to you then, Holly. I don't think it would we would be able to pinpoint that down to one group. It's a combination of um, factors across the service area. Um, we alluded in our report to the high vacancy rates that is going to have an impact on the work and quality of the work that our social workers can um, do with our children and families. A lot of our complaint activity um, that we get tends to be around um, social workers not returning phone calls and or um, giving them letters when they've said that they will give them letters and things like that, which is an area of, of um, improvement that we're really working on now in, in relation to that. And without the move into the new social work um, reshape of the offer with our assessment services and our support and strengthening families team, we're hoping that that will allow our social workers more time with children and families to prevent some of those complaints coming in. But it certainly isn't about inexperience or experience. I guess it's the context and the environment in which our social workers are operating currently. But we are fully aware of um, the feedback from our families and through our complaint activity. And there is um, plans, responsive plans in place to address that across the service. Thank you. Is that okay, Andrew? Yes, thank yeah. you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, John Colleen, please. Thank you. <clears throat> um, there's been several references to recruitment issues in this report. However, in the uh, monitoring report uh, that was written on the 10th of June, it states the approach to grow your own has resulted in the local authority projecting it will be fully staffed. 
by summer 2022. Is this realistic? And if so, has, is it going to be achieved? At the time of the offset inspection, that was our projection. So we had um, all of the newly qualified social workers and the nine social work apprentices that will be coming into our system in September would have filled all of our vacancies. Unfortunately, with the ongoing um, instability across that period of time because of the high vacancy rate and the impact of the reshape and moving into that system, it has um, offered some instability and we have um, seen some of our experienced workers leave over that time. So at the time we were speaking to Ofsted, that was a realistic projection. Um, our, certainly our vacancy rates are nowhere near the, the rates um, as of September this year um, that are reported in the report and they have significantly decreased but we do still hold some vacancies as, as it stands today. Those um, vacancies are out for recruitment at the minute. I believe the closed down packs have come in this week. So we have had um, several applications for each of those posts. So we are confident and it does remain a, a real focus of ours to make sure those vacancies are filled. Um, that, that's all for the questions from members, but I have a question of my own, if that's okay, just of uh, our social work colleagues, if you don't mind. Uh, I know it's the next item, so it's a bit cheeky to, to get it in here, but how, how have you found uh, Zaya's care management system to work with? Is, what are the challenges or, or, and what has it made easier? I think certainly from my perspective, there have been some challenges with the Zaya's. However, um, it is a definite improvement on our previous system. There are lots of positives with the Zaya's. Um, there's been some glitches. There's been instances where... Um, potential information that we've, we've put on has, has gone missing um, and that has been looked at um, and doesn't appear to be a, a, an ongoing issue. Um, also with Isaias, there, there is the element of the self-service um, element of it. If a social worker has left without approving visits, that then puts our social workers in a, a position where they then can't add additional visits. So that then has to be sent over to a performance technician to have it reallocated into our name. And, and, and that, that can be an issue. Um, but on the whole, I'm finding Isaias has improved over time. I don't know if Janet, you've got anything to add in relation to that? Um, uh, yes, I would, I've, um, I'm quite new to Isaias, having come, returned to the local authority after a, a time away. And I've, I think it's very user friendly. There are there are areas for development, and I'm, I'm aware that this is an ongoing daily development strategy in place, and new systems are being built all the time. So I think overall it's very user friendly, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to use. I find. Okay, that's good feedback. Um, so before we move to recommendations, I'll just give the portfolio holder, Councillor Aitken, the chance to to sum up or, or add any words to to the conversation we've had. No, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, really, what I want to say is, um, and, and I hope that you guys will all agree with me, it's really, it's a big well done. And I think, you know, we are, we're not there. We're not at the end of the road. There never will be an end to a road. But what, what has happened, and I would like to just sort of also say, Penny, obviously she's away at the moment, so she's not able to join, join this meeting. Under her leadership, she has got an amazing team of people. When I first came into this ro role just over a year ago now, I came in and there were a lot of heavy heads. You know, heads were bowed. There was a lot of heavy hearts. It was hard work. There, there were a lot of staff that were trudging through a bit of mud. And I, um, and I think I have shared this with you sort of on a one-to-one -one basis. Is this team have literally, they now have a spring in their step. Their heads are held high. They are believing in the system. So that's well done to those team leaders, that strategic direction, that, that those changes that were put in place, those have, those have now, they're now really filtering it down to our frontline service providers. And I can walk down the corridors here in County Hall or out on, out on site visits and things and actually have people, staff, young staff coming up to me and saying, hello, they're, they're bouncy, they're, ex, they're exuberant, they've got, They've got career tra trajectory in their minds. This is, this is a local authority now that people that are from our community that want a career progression can actually look in a really positive way. And what's really great is that you can see there we've got social worker staff that are nodding and agreeing. And I think that's really well done. And I'd say well done to Owen, well done to Penny and her team. And I'll pinch um, Owen's words. He said, right, and he opened with, he opened with strategic direction and creating stable building blocks. 
And that's what I'm a bit of a, a, a monkey because I like everything done yesterday and I keep them under that pressure. But to be fair, the stable building blocks are actually what this community needs. It's what our, our council needs. It's what our residents need, our service users need. We need this to be for the future for, so that we can build Practices will change. We've got interesting debate coming up next, you know, with Isaias. We've all known about those challenges, but it's really positive that we are, I'm not saying the job's done, but we're moving in the right direction. And this is absolutely right. And I'm very pleased to say a lot of you came to see the wellbeing bus um, at last full council meeting. It was great to be able to promote that and show that. But it's, it's good for us as elected members to appreciate our staff as well, because that matters too. So, you know, we here in, in children's uh, scrutiny, but me as a portfolio holder, we're advocates for not only our, our services and our kids, but also for our staff. So I think it's been a fantastic report. I say, well done, Holly, for, for what you've, you know, what the work you've put in. But, you know, under Penny's leadership, I think it's great. And we're not there yet. I don't, don't deny we're not there yet. We'll all hold our breath when Ofsted arrive in the autumn, winter period next. But... I've got big aspirations, I've got big hopes, and I've got big confidence. So I think it's well done, and thank you very much. Very well said. It almost felt like there should have been a round of applause at the end of that, didn't it? Thank you. Uh, but that, that does bring us nicely onto the recommendations, though, because the first recommendation, recommendation is that this subcommittee recognises the progress made by Children's Care Services since 2019, and to commend all the staff for their hard work and dedication uh, in improving the service. Uh, second of all, Councillor Weeks, I think from your question, we had a recommendation that either the subcommittee receives a briefing note or that full council receives a report from the portfolio holder on, on the Memorandum of Understanding, Councillor Weeks. Yeah, uh, with your permission, I, I, I think it would be good if we could almost strengthen that a little bit and maybe give um, Councillor Aitken the opportunity with our backing to go away and explore ways in which we can approach this at a national level. I was really encouraged to hear what Owen was saying about um, the fact that other local authorities and other areas and um, regions are uh, exploring how, um, you know, further memorandum of understanding. But to me, the best way to do this would uh, to be a national understanding. Um, and if through your contacts in national government and on any boards that you sit on, if we can start having this conversation about, uh, and I recognize the important role that um, agency workforces play, but we need to try and break this cycle between staff leaving to join agency work, uh, join agency work, the then coming back on double the salary because we can't recruit the jobs because the staff are leaving to agency work and that it's that cycle that needs breaking and i think i could be completely wrong but the only way we're going to break that is through intervention at a national level so thank you i, I think it's important to be ambitious so councillor aiken any thoughts yeah as you know you all know me well enough to know i'm ambitious um I, obviously i was down in london last week when we were lobbying for fairer funding I don't, I have no problem whatsoever. I, I will need to have conversations with Owen and Paul and Penny and the team to find out what, how, how best we can do that. But I'll willingly do that. We'll see, see whether it's as writing. If I can go and beat my drum, then, you know, I'll be, I'll be more than willing to do that. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's, it's a good idea. Let's, let's see what, it, what we can do. My slight reservation about full council, uh, not that I'm again, I mean, more than happy to stand up and talk at full council, but I get very limited time at full council to be able to do that. You know, I sort of get two slots, a slot, um, one slot twice a year. And, um, and that lasts for five minutes. I think you need a briefing paper to come back so that you get actual facts. And then if, if, if on the back of that, you want to put a question through full council, then we might develop it that way. But I think for me to actually use it as part of my portfolio briefing, it's a five minute slot and I only get two a year. So. That, it, that that probably in the best tool. Okay. Yeah. Are members happy with that recommendation? Are there any further recommendations? Are you happy with that, Alison? Yeah. Would you be happy if I just split that into two then and did B to relate to the briefing note um, for, for the data about the local one and then C um, recommend that Councillor Rick can explore how there could be potential for a national memorandum? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's fine. Okay, that concludes that item. Thank you for coming. Uh, it was a good conversation. I enjoyed that one. <laughs> Councillor Copsey, can we, can we have a, a sound test? Because we had a problem with a, a speaker from Zoom coming through the laptop. So could you just say something? Absolutely no problem. Can you hear me all right? Much better. Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you in the room. Uh, doing a great job there, Nick. Members, ready to get started on the, the next agenda item, uh, agenda item four, the Isaias Care Management System. For this one, we have uh, Jill Vickers joining us in Zoom. Is Jill here? She's not, not here yet. Uh, we have Owen and Paul Elliott, Jonathan Hall and Michael Black. Uh, hand over to you then, Owen. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, please introduce this item and just to quickly set the scene um, across the children and adult social care world there are in the region of four or five main providers of uh, systems such as the Isaias care systems that are designed to do a variety of tasks one to capture and record the activity of social workers social care staff to make sure it is a clear and accurate record of the involvement. But these systems have evolved over the years uh, and they've become more process as well as just recording systems, which means that they help to take practitioners through a series of tasks which are set out and prescribed in national guidance. Uh, one of uh, social care colleagues earlier described how, you know, if one bit of the task isn't complete, the system will object to ensure that it is uh, completed. Thirdly, it's designed to make sure that we've got a real time reporting on the activity that's going on. And it's a critical quality assurance uh, and performance management tool. Um, what uh, the committee will, will know is that the work of both adult and children's social care is incredibly complex. It's humans dealing with humans, mm -hmm. and therefore the system has to have a degree of flexibility and has to be able to change occasionally as those processes also change. The Isaias Care was introduced a couple of years ago to replace a long-standing legacy system, a system that by that time had well outgrown its uh, use uh, and was causing uh, some problems, I think, for social work and for delivering the service as it was. However, changing systems uh, is an incredibly difficult and complex task. I've uh, been part of it myself in at least two other local authorities. Uh, and whilst on paper it looks like a simple switch off, switch on exercise, in reality, of course, you have to move all of the information and all of the activity from the old system into the new one in order for that new system to be able to have some continuity of understanding of families' lives, adults, children, parents. Um, so uh, the simple implementation of Isaias isn't simple, and that's for three or four reasons. One, um, right at the point in which we are implementing this system, there has been a blizzard of government policy change in relation to uh, a whole variety of things, but specifically in this case, adults' social care, children's social care and the SEND arrangements. So those processes that all of the modern systems are designed to cope with are all currently under review, whether it's our new system or some of the existing systems that our local authorities have. So there's a twin track exercise going on at the moment. One is to land Isaias Care as it was intended to be used out of the box. And I think the report, and we've got colleagues from the program board with us today, will confirm that that exercise is happening. And I was pleased to hear the feedback from social care colleagues earlier. But of course, it's doubly complicated by the fact that even now at this early stage, the Isaias care system needs significant changes, as do all of the social care systems that operate uh, across the country at the moment to reflect and accommodate those policy changes that have come into play. So um, I think if we were not looking at those policy changes, we would be reporting a phase one job done outcome at this point. But actually, whilst phase one is implemented, 
of course, we're back to the beginning in some aspects of the system to make sure it can match and accommodate the activity it's now required to capture. Um, there are two other comments I'd like to make. One, implementing systems like this is not simply a technical exercise. It does require those people using the system to learn about it, to understand the system, and to, frankly, to make friends with the system so that it becomes their tool rather than something that they have to constantly update because that's what the system requires. Uh, we're on a journey with that. Um, I, I, Jill, my colleague Jill, Executive Director of Adult Services, will uh, describe the adult journey, but I think it's reflective of across both children and adult services where practitioners are now starting to learn how to use the system as it's intended to be used, albeit while behind the scenes, the system itself is starting to morph and change for the reasons I've described. But that is a continuing and ongoing challenge, and we're increasing our training capacity across children's to make sure that people do use the system in the way that it's intended to be used, because without the right information in the system, it goes without saying, we're simply not going to get the right information out of the system. And that can affect our performance reporting, it can affect the information and our understanding of families, uh, and it can slow down the whole social work process. Very final comment from me is that um, the system itself has got huge potential, uh, huge potential that uh, in phase two, we hope to realize, but as I've explained, phase two won't be straightforward. Some of the really important additional features this system will bring will be something called a portal functionality. That means in essence that other agencies and at some point perhaps even families and foster carers and others can access parts of the system to see for themselves what we have recorded and to make sure that the information that is in our possession about them is both accurate and up to date. That, that at this stage remains a plan and an aspiration but I think uh, as I hand over to colleagues um, in adult services and to Jill, our priority at the moment is making sure that the basics are working as we continue to change the system to reflect the adult and children's social care policy changes. So with your agreement, Chair, I'll hand over to Jill yep. to give an adult yep. perspective. Jill, would you like to, to add to that? Uh, thank you, Owen, and thank you, Chair, and good morning, councillors. Um, Yes, it's a, a very movable feast for us in adult social care at the moment. So we have uh, new legislation coming at us uh, quite, quite rapidly. So back in sept uh, September 2021, the ge government set out its plan for adult social care reforms. One of the key things being that uh, there will be a cap on the amount that anyone in England will spend on their personal care over their lifetime, the cap being 86,000. Now, what that means is that there are many, many people in East Riding who fund their own care, self-funders, and um, we will need to have systems in place by December in ASIUS so that from April, we can start opening care accounts for people who are self-funders to help them to meter towards the cost of their cap. Um, and it's not just as simple as as soon as they've spent 86,000, they reach the cap because uh, hotel costs, if you like, are not allowable. So if somebody's in a nursing home, uh, there is an element of hotel costs and there's an element of care costs. So we have to meet the care costs until they reach that cap. Now, that all needs to be built into ASEAS alongside our resource allocation system, strength-based resource allocation system. And that is going to take quite a considerable amount of work and testing between now and next April. So you can see that priorities change very quickly, but this is indeed um, a major priority for us, but also for children's services, because it will also uh, take into account the costs of young people coming up through transitions and direct payments. Uh, we have other legislation coming through as well. So fair cost of care and um, making sure that we speak to all of the providers in East Riding and understand what their business costs are so that we can set a level that we feel is a fair cost of care. So uh, there's going to be a lot of work for the ASEAS team and um, I fully appreciate that they've got an awful lot on at the moment, but this is a must do. And that's probably all I'm going to say on the matter there. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jill. Would, would any other colleagues like to, to add to that? Jonathan. Hi there. 
Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I haven't got a lot to add to that because Owen and Jill have done a very solid introduction of the report. But I will say that we did embark out on phase two of this program earlier this, well, later last year, after going live with the main system in May last year. Um, as Owen and Jill point out, there's been lots of national change happening, lots of practice process change, which is now I meaning we've got to reshape our phase two plans. At the moment, we've got a phase two plan that runs through to September 2023. When we've replanted that plan, talking about all the things that Owen and Jill have just mentioned, that plan is going to run longer and we'll be doing more as well with the service areas. Um, there's key things happening at the moment, and that is making sure we've got lots of training resource available for adults and children's services. And this is for practice and process based training, not solely IT based training. So it's not all about systems, it's about process as a whole right now. And we're adding resources to adults and children's direct to be able to do that work within the businesses themselves. That's a really key activity over the next few months. Um, we're also doing a vast amount of work around performance reporting now for children's services. So we're adding a new technology called Power BI, and this will allow service areas to access reports directly themselves in real time with data being refreshed every single day. That will really help improving the line of sight into the service areas. Some of that work will start to go live from August this year. And I can't underestimate how much effort there is happening there in the background because to get good, reliable reports, you've got to have good, reliable information in your systems in the first place. I mean, that we have to have reliable, robust processes, as well as we've got to do all the technical work to write the reports and make them available. So that's all happening in the background now. Um, there are some other benefits here for adult services as well, because once this proof of concept and pilots has happened with children's services, We'll be able to look at reporting for adult service after that as well. So it's a double benefit. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that um, the programme to date has run to plan as far as timescales go. There was a short delay uh, due to COVID of seven months, which, if you look at the scale of what we're trying to achieve, um, was quite exceptional. The adults and children's services were able to respond still during a pandemic to be able to deliver this kind of massive change programme. So my thanks go out to both service areas for working with my team to make that happen because it was a very arduous journey during those months. Um, last thing I'll mention is um, the budget. So the programme has been delivered um, to budget to date and the facts and figures are in section five of the report if you'd like to have a look at those. Okay, I think that's everything from me, thank you. Perfect, thank you for that uh, presentation. We'll move to members' questions and first I have Councillor Dewhurst. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I just want to uh, cover training, and specifically on page 36, where it outlines that uh, adult social care has secured three business change officers uh, and children uh, have one temporary training and development officer planned. Um, so the question to, to both Jill and to Owen, do you feel that is sufficient to meet the training needs? And secondly, is the more we can do to pool those training resources as opposed to compete for them? Oh, and Chair, if I, if I ask uh, Mr. Elliott to respond to that. Paul then. So just, just to confirm from a children's perspective, we, we I can hot off the press, um, confirm that yesterday we secured some additional funding. So from a children's perspective, we, we, will, we will have four training and development posts. So they will be going, we've recruited to one and the other three will be going out live for recruitment today. So that's really good news from a children's social care perspective, um, which means now we can actually start to move the, the plan forward in terms of the development work from a children's social care perspective and that training element for the workforce, which will, will massively help in the context of making sure what we're putting into the system is accurate and then what we get out of the system is, is also accurate. So from that perspective, it's great news from children's services. We are also working with our ad adult colleagues to look at the uh, longevity around pooling resource going forward. At the moment, as, um, as Jill has, uh, has mentioned, and Owen has mentioned, there is um, quite significant differing priorities for adults and for children. So at the moment, we are um, really keen to ensure that that resource remains separate because of the priorities. However, we, we are in discussions once those key priorities are in the system and our staff are trained to start to pull that resource together. So we have one development and one training resource across both adults and children 
with some some additional support around that, which will be service specific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Firstly, I apologise for my late appearance. I was on an engagement with Councillor Johnson, so um, apologies for that. Uh, with reference to the, this uh, Isaiah's care, Chair, um, when this first came up uh, before children and young people, which seems like an age ago, um, I, I raised what I thought were some significant concerns, um, and these were sp um, specifically uh, the cost of the system and the, the amount of time it appeared to be taking to get into operation. I was also conscious that as a committee, and certainly myself as uh, a member, um, whilst not being a technophobe, I'm not quite up there or down there with the youth or with people who do these things. Uh, and I, I thought it'd be a, um, rather good for this committee if we could actually see a demonstration of the system in action. Um, that hasn't come to uh, fruition as yet, but I would like to suggest, Chair, that we, we look into that. Uh, just coming down to a, a couple of specific questions, if I may. Um, I, I note that we, we signed the contracts in 2018, I believe. Uh, for in the sum of 1.4, more nearly one and a half million pounds, and that the contract will be renewed or there's a potential of being renewed in 2022. Um, bearing in mind that we don't seem to have uh, actually got it fully working yet, is there any question of having some sort of rebate from Isaiah's Care for the fact that they've given us something which we're having to boat programs onto to make it operate for, uh, effectively for our authority? And also, Chair, I'm concerned about uh, bearing in mind Council um, Charles Dewhurst's uh, comments regarding um, training and such like. We seem to be morphing into building a, a bit of a monster here because we're, we're having uh, new appointees all over the place, from three business change officers to uh, we're, we're employing uh, a member of the, of the ASEAS programme team. Uh, and incidentally, I would have thought if we're buying something from someone, they should provide the training for that without us having to go out and get extra people. Uh, uh, and also, we're, we've got um, uh, another bozo coming in. Sorry, did I say bozo? I didn't mean bozo. Um, we've, we've got another chap coming in as a, as a consultant, and um, I, I'm getting a bit wary of consultants, but invariably, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, um, consultants tend to come in, tell you what you already know, and charge you a small fortune for it. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about this, Chair. Um, just to find out, I, I would like a, a, a response to my question regarding um, cost uh, and whether actually Azeus should be providing us with more backup for what is, after all, their system and which we're trying to use for our, our resources. And also, Chair, I would like to see some indication of how the system works in practice, uh, even if it's dumbed down so that it's uh, sufficiently simple for a person like me to understand. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. So to summarise, you have a question that is, for the cost of Zeus, would, would, should we be seeing more support from the people who provide that system? And secondly, I have a recommendation that the committee receives a demonstration of Zeus. You said it's so much uh, shorter than me, Chair. Thank you. It's quite easy sometimes, Councillor Whittle. Owen, would you like to take over? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to pick up some, some of those issues, um, I, th I think it's really important to reassure the committee that Isaias is well and truly switched on uh, and is delivering. And we've had that you know, confirmed by practitioners here today, but also um, we've had it confirmed by Ofsted and by the DfE. Um, it, it's, it's a slightly more sort of conceptual answer than a practical answer, but Isaias really isn't just a technical system. It is actually everything that we currently do. And therefore making this system deliver everything that we need to make, it involves all aspects of the local authority. There is undoubtedly the out of the box technical product which Isaias has sold us uh, and as yet and as the chair of the Isaias board uh, I have not been or had reported to me that the system doesn't work or isn't effective uh, but of course when you then zoom out uh, we have to start focusing on uh, the comments I made earlier about this is a system that was designed in a policy context which has now changed beyond recognition that really does matter because it really does dictate to local authorities that we need to behave differently in relation to many, many processes and aspects 
Um, the beauty of Isaias, perhaps more so than some of the other systems, is that it is more customizable than perhaps some of those older systems are, which means we are, despite the challenges and despite the costs, able to be more fleet of foot in some of those changes than we certainly would have been with our legacy system and probably would be with some of the other systems that uh, we looked at in the first instance. We've really got a tight eye on the budget for this because uh, it is something that without that close eye could spiral uh, out of control. But at this moment in time, uh, I would say the offer from Isaias and the support from Isaias it is without question. We have a member of the Isaias company who continues to sit on the board, who is able to kind of real time take away developments, tweaks and changes, which actually aren't always in the original contract. Uh, and we are relying on, on their fleet of footness as much as ours, because none of us could have predicted what we would be trying to I implement over time. I think the idea of sharing what the system looks like and how it operates would be really useful because it will hopefully give committee a sense of the breadth of what this system is intended to do, but also the absolute extent to which we rely on it. It, it will dictate and share and pay those people that we're required to pay, including our foster carers. It will make sure that our police colleagues and our probation service can instantly recognise where there are children that are falling between uh, stools. Uh, it will make sure that our social workers are spending more time with families and less time uh, in front of the screen. It's already starting to do that. And it does give us the opportunity to make sure that we can remotely uh, input information into the system as we move forward, which again creates a much more agile offer uh, to the workforce. But I don't want to sit here and pretend to be a champion of the ASEA system. I, I think recognize entirely the questions that have been raised um, and, and understand that on the face of it, there are ex significant costs associated uh, with this system. Some of those will remain because they're not implementation costs. They are, in fact, maintenance and operational costs, and some of them will subside. Uh, Paul, Mr. Elliott mentioned the development costs, and that's our contribution to making sure that social workers also understand the changes that the policy will bring to their practice and their systems. So in short, uh, fully understand the concerns about the apparent costs, would like to reassure the committee that our relationship with Isaias is strong and professional. We bring challenge where we need to and, and allow other colleagues to comment on that. They are responsive. Uh, they are uh, acting uh, occasionally beyond what's expected of them within the original contract because of these changes. Uh, but we do review that on, on a very regular basis. And certainly, uh, being mindful of data protection and the fact that there's a lot of personal information uh, in the system. Uh, I'm sure it'd be possible to demonstrate a dummy set of the system, which will give that breath. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, satisfied? Yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. Councillor Weeks then, please. Yeah. Thank you. I read through this report and, and I think the problem with it is that we know because we don't live under a rock that there are problems with Isaias. And we've known that for a while. And we, we hear that from frontline staff that we talk to. We hear that from the portfolio holder. We know that across adults and children's, there are still issues with the rollout of Isaias. Yet this report barely touches on that. I mean, I'm looking at current issue, the current issues section doesn't really explain what the current issues are. The most honest part of the, the report, I think, sits in children's services section, where it says it's acknowledged within children's services that the current schedule of not work is not where it was needed to be. There's no detail in here about what the issues are. And I would have thought that when we went through a year's worth of scrutiny of the send system and we constantly went on about how scrutiny needs to be informed about the issues that are going on within departments that the fact that we've been presented with a report that doesn't tell us anything is really disappointing and i'd hope and I, there's, there's two parts to my question first one i'd hope that the, the staff that the officers that are with us now can be honest and explain to us maybe in not 
as much detail because we've not got very much time, but the headline figures about what the issues are. I mean, if you look at significant work is already underway in respect to the following areas, and they've listed the areas, but they've gone into no detail about what work is being undertaken, why it was needed to be undertaken, how it's being addressed and how far along it is. And the second question I'd ask is if you presented this report to frontline staff that are working with the system day in, day out, would they say that this is an accurate representation of what's happening on the ground? Because quite honestly, I, I don't think this tells us anything. And I'm sorry to be negative, but I, I just think it's a bit disappointing. Owen, would you like to come Thank back? Thank you, Chair. Chair, I just have to sort of make the point, first of all, that, that nobody has been dishonest this morning in, in the presentations they've made, nor is there any attempt to mislead committee in relation to the report that's in front of us. Uh, I've been close to this uh, system uh, for over a year now. I chair the board uh, and would want to reassure committee on several points. The first is that uh, the regulator, and, and we all know, you know how scrupulous and robust they are for children of Stead, use this system to scrutinize our work uh, and would not be averse to commenting negatively if they thought the system was either inadequate or ineffective. In fact, quite the opposite, and they've seen an improvement in the system compared to the system that we had. Um, I will uh, let Jill comment in terms of the adult experience. We have user groups across children's services. It's absolutely right that when you are confronted with a new system, particularly for those staff who've been involved in another system for a long period of time, that it will involve change and it will sometimes be confusing. But I think we heard firsthand this morning from staff who weren't anticipating the question that their experience is it's better than what they've had previously uh, and even more positive feedback on that. I I'm certainly not here to defend the system, but I am here to absolutely reassure the committee that perhaps some of the kind of concerns and some of the kind of challenges that have just been described are more akin to the fact that as with every other local authority at the moment, uh, we are now trying to manage a system that was designed for one set of policy initiatives and is now trying to predict and anticipate a whole raft of new ones. I can't understate that because uh, within children's world at least, and I'm sure my colleague Jill will um, explain for adults, even a small tweak to a policy or a process will inevitably change the whole pathway of an intervention for a social worker or a social care professional it isn't therefore difficult to imagine if a single pathway changes, the whole system subsequently needs to be amended. Uh, Isaiah is allowing us to do that whilst at the same time keeping the current show on the road. Um, I have never worked in my 30 years uh, of social care in any local authority where people will celebrate an IT system. They are not. They are counterintuitive perhaps to the role and the work of social care, but they are necessary. Uh, and currently, uh, the system that we've got stands up very well against those other available systems at the moment. Uh, at this point in time, it's disappointing that we have to keep amending and changing the system, but we also have to make sure that we don't turn all of our concern onto that technical solution. It requires our performance colleagues, our social workers, uh, our partners and everyone else to collaborate on making sure we've got the best possible arrangements in place, the system will then support those. Thank you, Owen. Jill, I will give you the opportunity to, to, to give an adult's perspective in a second, but first I'm just gonna move to the portfolio holder of children so we can just stay on children's and then we'll circle back to adults. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, Councillor Whittle. I, um, I really appreciate um, your, your, your question. I think um, it's a, a bit like the previous, previous subject that we were talking about. Uh, when I first came into this role in um, children's services, there was a lot of treacle, a lot of mud that staff were having to plough through. I think Isaias absolutely falls into that. I think that where we were with Isaias is a slightly different place to where we are now. And this is, to be fair, very recent. You know, it's been, it's, 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 there's been an awful lot of work that's been put in over the recent months to actually bring staff along. Um, you will recall that I um, joined in uh, in the autumn last year, a big event in Bridlington, where we were promoting the whole process of using Isaias and the systems and things like that. And the practices that uh, our staff we were, were being asked to, to change to. 
and and those those changes take time to to embed that being said i don't think we're there it's another another issue i think we're on on a on a moving trajectory but i would also really really i'm really really pleased i did know that um paul paul and the team were actually trying to get this funding for these extra posts i believe there's four posts that that he's got funding for i hadn't actually heard until just now that we've actually got that secured and that it, it that again will make a difference because that's all part of putting in the right templates into the system so that they meet the needs of our east riding families our east riding workforce and our 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 place because what what works here in the east riding won't necessarily work in hull and won't necessarily work in york certainly won't necessarily work in london so there isn't a, an off the peg meets all criteria and we are in we're on a we're on a progression and what I will share with you, which I haven't shared with you before, and that may be remiss of me, but we are, I, I am gaining more confidence in the Isaiah system. We are moving forward. It is becoming more positive. Um, I'm not saying it's done. I'm, 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 not, I'm not ready for that by, by, by any means yet, but I think it is important. And I think for you, Councillor Whittle, and your specific comments, I think, you know, well done for reminding us that, that, that of, of, of the challenges that you've made moving um, in the past. I am hopeful and fairly confident that, that you know, with these new four places, in, uh, and I am assured that these four places will help to create those new templates so that that usability, and it's as you said, Councillor Whittle, it's there's no point in having a system if our frontline staff can't use it quickly, efficiently, actually get that imp input in so that we can, so that our senior teams can pull the information out and our um, partners like Ofsted can pull the information out rapidly and quickly. Um, and at the end of the day, what we all need is for those frontline, particularly social worker staff, to be able to move quickly and agilely through the system so that they can then get to the next client, the next, the next family. Because as we we heard in the previous conversation um, with um, Holly and her team of social workers, it's a challenge to try and keep <laughs> all those posts um, filled, the vacancies. You know, there's a huge amount of work going on, and it's great that we're in the position we're at. But what we need to do is we need to make the system, which is what this is all about, the system behind Holly's work and her, her staff's work actually easier so that we takes the pressure off so it helps with the uh, staff welfare and it also helps with actually getting production up so I, th I i'm i'm confident that we're moving in the right direction um and i as i say i'm really pleased to hear i think it was really good news to hear from paul that we've got those um the funding for those extra four posts and i look forward to updating you and i'm sure you'll i mean we can do a briefing note if necessary you know, as an interim, you know, over um, maybe six month period to so that you, you can be kept updated as to how how that those four posts are working. OK, perfect. Thank you, Councillor Aitken. And apologies, Jill, would you like to add to that with a flavour of uh, adults? You're on mute, Jill. Just unmute yourself. Perfect, thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, if you ask any adult social care frontline staff, you'll get a mixed reaction, but that's not surprising really, because I think as my colleague Owen has said, any new system coming in is difficult because staff have to change what they do and the way they do it. Um, and they're always under pressure. My comment would be, and uh, it may not be a popular one, is that I've worked in a number of different authorities where we've brought in any of the big three, so Liquid Logic or Servalec. Um, I don't think there's a lot to choose between them, but what is important is that it takes at least 18 months, two years to implement, and that's without a pandemic um, and without the difficulty of getting hold of the right staff, because it requires entering all of our data into the new system and it, and it requires doing that properly. It requires training of staff really well and floor walking and all sorts. So I, you know, it's it's not great that we've got, we've always got um, issues, but that's true of any new system. And we've just got to kind of plough through and uh, support the staff and the people trying to make the changes in the system as much as we can, so that at the end of it, I'm sure we will have a decent product. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a wiggle from Council Weeks. Yeah, it's just a follow-up really, just 
on my first, the first part of my question, just to explain in a little bit more detail about what some of the current issues that we're facing are with the system, because we've heard a lot about the work that's been done to address the ones that, we, that have been addressed, and that's great. Um, my question was never about the work that we've that we've been doing. It's more about what what's still left to go. What what are we what are we still working on, and and what are what are those issues? Uh, Jonathan, are you taking that one? Hello, thank you. Um, I think that the best thing to do here is because we've got a, a deliverable list for phase two that goes up to about 200 items. Um, would you like me to go through that with you individually or as a, as a group to future meetings so that we can talk about it in some detail? Because I haven't got that to present to you right now, of course, but we can go through it. Um, I have to do that one to one or as a future session if you prefer. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy, I'm happy to go through it one to one. I suppose the purpose of my question was. The report says that there are still things that need doing and that there are still things that aren't that aren't quite right but it doesn't go into the detail about what those things are and we can't be expected to scrutinize something without understanding what what those issues are sure i mean some of these are covered in the report such as uh, adults finance for example so the the, the big priority we've got at the moment is migrating the rest of the non-residential financial processes out of the Abacus system they're currently in and over into ASIUS. Uh, phase one of the program was a, it was a like for like swap out from SWIFT. So everything that was in SWIFT, we took it out, popped it into ASIUS. There's a whole lot of other processes surrounding SWIFT that are outside the system. And they're currently done in price systems like Abacus one, for example. Um, and phase two is to pull some of those processes into the system, as well as further enhanced processes that were put in from SWIFT because a lot of processes that were in SWIFT um, were only as good as the products that was available at the time. And we can do a lot more with them now, make improvements for the service areas. So it's, it's building on what was already migrated across, plus a roadmap of entirely new things as well. So when, this is my last question, I promise, when it says at um, paragraph 2.11, 2.11, it says um, it is acknowledged within children's services that the current mm -hmm. schedule of work is not where it was planned to be. What does that mean? Okay, um, that is talking about our phase two program and meaning that work is stalling in the service area because there's not enough resource to move the developments forward now in the service area, which is why Paul and Owen have put further development of training resource into the service areas to allow that work to move on forward. So maybe it's, maybe it's a poor turn of phrase in the report. It's not referring to resources, it's referring to the fact that work is slowing down to a, to a very slow pace now. Councillor Weeks, can I bring in Paul? But thank you. It may just help to give to give some sort of probably some detail, I guess is what you're asking for. Um, so I guess from a children's social care perspective, I think where we are at the moment is um, we had a phase one implementation and, and then we've obviously got plans for phase two implementation. So in terms of um, phase two implementation, there are a number of um, activities within children's social care, which currently aren't um, practically built into the system, if that makes sense. So a lot of the work in phase two is around building in our pathways, building in our forms, building in our systems into ASEAS. So because in phase one, we prioritize our key our key processes. So in terms of activity, phase two is very much around um, the completion, if you like, of having everything built into our ZEA system. So there's a, there's a big program of work, which will probably be about 18 months to, to get all of children's social care systems, processes, forms, pathways built into ASEAS. So that's quite an ambitious program. Um, alongside that, we have got some remedial work to do in respect to phase one around um, as Owen alluded to, changes in legislation. So we're having to amend some of the pathways, some of the processes that were put into ASEAS in phase one because of the changes in legislation, et cetera. Linked to that is um, we've got to change some of our workforce behaviour as well in terms of what they're putting into the system. So overall, it's a really complicated picture in terms of we're constantly working with the workforce to change behaviour, we're constantly reviewing what we've already got in the system because it is in constant change. And then also alongside that, we're having to build into the system the rest of the social care, children's social care processes, which weren't in phase one. 
So, so it's a very complicated picture in that sense. Um, as Jonathan alluded to, that work has stalled in children's services because the resource was not there. And also because of the, the ask is, is quite significant. So these, these, these additional posts will absolutely now give us the opportunity to get the training and development offer out so we can change practitioner behavior. We can absolutely amend and change what we need to do, which is already in the system from phase one. And now we can actually get moving on phase two implementation. So hopefully within that 18 month, two year period, we'll have every system and process that children's social care use built into the system. And then it will be just be a matter of updating um, as things change. So, so I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. And that should have been in the report to start with. And it's not a criticism, but when we're talking about scrutiny, this is the sort of information we need. It's that level of detail. Perfect, thank you. I have on the back of that a central amendment to the recommendation that Councillor Whittle proposed, which was to, to have a demonstration of the Zaius uh, system to committee, that, that that recommendation includes a discussion or demonstration of the challenges as well, the practical challenges, whether it be submitting data or not. I have, I have three wiggles on that. I'm going to move to Councillor Aitken. Councillor Whittle and then Councillor Johnson. It's a very quick wiggle, and it's just to just to assure you, um, Councillor Weeks, that I didn't know. I knew that we were asking, and I knew that it was hopefully in the pipeline that these four posts were going to be funded. And I've only found out this morning as well. So I think, to be fair, that's why it's not in the document because in, when the document was written, we didn't have that information. So it's just a, just an observation. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for taking on board my um, recommendation. Um, perhaps we could also add into that uh, that we uh, have input from uh, one of the frontline workers who actually uses the system rather than having it demonstrated to us by perhaps um, uh, an expert or somebody from Mosaic or wherever. Officers are nodding that, that that's acceptable, so if you could note that down, please, Alison. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and apologies for being late this morning. Um, I, just a, an observation, really. You've you've mentioned that you know there's these new jobs that are, are coming in, based with adults on business change. But it sounds to me from what you're saying, it's actually culture change that is is needed to be embedded. And are there any um, plans to to maybe uh, em employ somebody to look at culture change rather than than business change? I'm sure Owen's got a comment on that one. Owen. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the culture change does and has to come from the workforce and from the leadership in, in, the, in the social care workforce. Uh, I, you know, we heard this morning from two manager, advanced practitioner and social worker, that that's where that behaviour change has to come from. The posts that have been described uh, are, are to do two things. One, to track changes to the processes that are now required as a consequence of the making uh, the case for change uh, changes that are coming our way uh, to for that purpose and they will not be long term posts because at some point in the system has to stop changing, uh, we hope, and the other two are about training and the training is specifically about how practitioners engage directly with the system through the keyboard so there's a there's a kind of hearts and minds piece and there's a technical piece uh, and the two things have to kind of run alongside each other but I, i'm feeling really optimistic in terms of the culture change piece because i think in the item prior to this one there's really strong evidence across you know the, the, the workforce and from penny and her team down that they've got a strong grip on that culture now and will be able to direct and steer it as it needs to Perfect, thank you. Councillor Johnson's happy, uh, which brings us on to our next and final question at this stage, unless anyone would like to signal to Councillor Hammond that they have one. Uh, Councillor Steele, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman. I think most of my questions have been answered now, but you know, it is, I've been involved in a similar uh, change of computerisation in the hospital setting, and it is very much about bringing the staff along with it. So are they have they been convinced for the need for it and you've added another need in during this um, meeting regarding um, the different routes of funding and how necessary it is to follow that so are they kept informed of all this so they can see why it has to be done and that they have to make these little sacrifices in order to learn a new system Paul absolutely I think 
within within the, the within the portfolio, we've we've got um, a lead, an Isaias lead, uh, and her role is very much about connecting with the workforce around um, what it feels like for frontline practitioners using the system, um, and that that uh, information is um, is two way. It, it, it demonstrates the importance of the system and why it's important for children, young people, and and the families that we work with, but also we're really interested to know what it feels like on the ground in terms of what works well, what doesn't work so well, and that does inform our future planning around our pathways within the system. We bring all that information to, to in children's to a weekly meeting. So we meet with the ASEAS board, we meet with our IT colleagues every week, and that really crucial information about um, how it feels for frontline practitioners is brought to that meeting so we can ensure that um, any future developments takes on board that really useful, um, often critical feedback from a critical friend perspective, if that makes sense. But likewise, that gives us an opportunity also to go into the workforce to, to actually support the workforce in terms of the use of the system. And these posts will only enhance that because they will actually be put in the practice system. They will work alongside practitioners. They will walk the floor, as Jill mentioned earlier, um, so it will be an absolutely key, the, the key in terms of that two-way process, in terms of what it feels like operationally on the ground using the system for the children and young people that they're working with. Thank you, because we really do not want to risk losing valued and very experienced staff. And uh, I just encourage them to bear with it for the moment. Um, I have been through this and, it, you know, it is a bit of a, a wrench, but um, it will be okay in the end, I think we have to say. Absolutely. And sorry, just to add, I think we are in a very different space. I think, obviously, we, we had lots of challenge at the beginning of the implementation, new system, as we've, we've, we've talked about today. I think what we've been able to do is actually demonstrate to the workforce that actually this is a really useful system. It enables them to do their work much easier. So, and I think also the way that we've been able to respond to, to worries that they've had and actually you know, alleviate some of those worries has really meant we've got a workforce that's engaged in, in the Isaiah system. And we constantly um, remind staff that we're still, we're still developing and you know, we're still evolving. So I think um, we, we've absolutely, certainly in children's, have got our workforce on the same page. We're always going to have some parts of our workforce that will you know, not like that change, but we're working alongside those people to, to get them on board. So I'm fairly confident, certainly from the feedback that I receive and certainly the feedback today from operational staff that the use of Isaias and the, the practitioner's use of Isaias is in, is in a good space at the present time. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, that brings an end to the questions. Uh, we are ahead of time, although the the conversation I think was concise but really constructive uh, so I will give uh, the portfolio holder an opportunity to sum up concisely thank you <laughs> I'll try and be concise uh, Nick yeah um I think I think the this this subject obviously it has been something that this committee has put a lot of effort into understanding and following and I think it's really important that you do that um, I think that um, I welcome you know you sort of having a deeper dive into it to help understand um, I can't, I can't deny the, the four posts. I am really pleased to hear about that because I know that um, the staff that are, are managing the system are under, under the cosh and that those extra four posts will, I'm sure, make a huge difference. Um, we're not there yet. Um, we've, as Owen's already described, you know, it's probably an 18, two year rollout now. Um, and we don't know what central government are gonna throw at us, what changes are gonna come. And obviously those all put their own hurdles in, in, in the system. But no, I think it's really good, it's really good news. And um, I'd say thank you to the committee for being so interested. Um, and be assured that I will be continuing to have conversations with frontline staff as well as senior officers. But it is important, and you're absolutely right, that it is important that we hear how frontline staff feel about it. And I'm hoping that over the next six months, that I will feel that change, just like I described that I changed, I felt that change in our social working staff. I think that we, in, um, as far as, you know, sort of um, finance and recruitment and all those sort of things, I think with this, with the ASEA system, I want to hear that from those frontline staff and I'm sure it'll come. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, and thank you for your work as well. Um, that brings us to recommendations. Um, if the committee would like to nod and agree as I read them out, recommendation A is that the subcommittee recognises the level of work and commitment that was required by all service areas to deliver the ASEAS programme during a period of exceptional change and challenge. Yeah. Uh, recommendation B is that the subcommittee supports phase two of the programme and understands the benefits for council staff and its clients. And recommendation C, which is a mixed match of, of Councillor Whittles and various other conversations that's gone on since, which is something along the lines of uh, to, to, for the committee to receive a demonstration of the ASEA system, which will include its challenges and input from a frontline user slash worker that uses the service. Alison, are you happy with us? Yeah, that's, that's really good. I'll get those down. Perfect. Thank you. And that takes us on to agenda items five and six, the work programme and forward plan of key decisions. And that's you as well. It is. Um, there's no update to the work programme and there's nothing on the forward plan of key decisions. So all I've really got to say is that just wanted to remind everybody that there's a high needs funding session um, on the 20th of July in person in room one. Um, and just for the three members that were booked on the front door visit on the 20th, that's actually been moved um, to the 19th of October. Did you have a question, Councillor Dewhurst? Councillor Dewhurst. Very quick question, possibly due to my own diary mismanagement. I had the next meeting in on the 7th of September, but it says the 14th. Can I just confirm it is the 14th? That's what it says on the paper, yeah. It's um, the yeah, 14th okay. of September. Yeah. Awesome. Is that all right? I think there was a mix up in the original work programs that went out and it is actually the 14th of September. Yeah. Perfect. That just leaves me to thank everyone for the patience today while I've, I've been chairman and, and, and that concludes the meeting. So thank you very much for, for all your hard work and I'll see you after, after recess. Yeah. 20. Okay. All right. Okay. Is, is that a public session? Yes, remember. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>